Well, I'll call us to order. Thank you very much for coming uh, to this first session in our seminar on intellectual property and life sciences. Um, I want to thank sponsors. Uh, this this uh, symposium is put on the, by the bioethics program, but it's also supported very heavily by uh, the biotechnology office, by uh, a grant from Pioneer DuPont, uh, by the College of Arts and Sciences and the lectures program people have been especially helpful. So thank you so much, Pat and Molly, for all of your help in this. Uh, I also expressly want to thank Janet Kringle, who did so much to, to help bringing, uh, bring this together. Um, the first session uh, in this uh, uh, presentation, the first sessions will be on traditional knowledge and uh, uh, um, uh, issues related to traditional knowledge. So we're very fortunate to have with us Shantavia Johnson and Robert Streifer. I'll introduce Shantavia uh, in a moment during the second hour. So let me begin by introducing uh, Rob Streifer, who's been an old friend uh, uh, of mine. Rob Streifer serves in the Department of Philosophy at the University of Wisconsin at Madison, where he also has joint appointments in the Department of Medical History and Bioethics, the Department of Medical Sciences, the School of Veterinary Medicine, the Department of Agriculture and uh, Agricultural and Applied Economics, the College of Agricultural and Life Sciences, and I'm running out of fingers, but I'm not done, uh, and the Gaylord Institute for Environmental Studies. Uh, Rob's research includes work on bioethics, both agricultural and medical, uh, ethical theory, metaethics, political philosophy, with a focus on ethical and policy issues arising out of, uh, of biotechnology. Um, so we're very fortunate to have him here with us today. I could, I could go on listening, listing his uh, accolades and honors, but I think I'll, uh, I'll spare you that. You can look them up. Um, but we're very fortunate to have him today, and we're very fortunate to have from him a presentation on Ojibwe objections to wild rice research. So uh, please join me in welcoming Rob Streifer. Thank you, Clark. Uh, you were doing some double counting there. So some of those were departments, and then some of them were the schools in which the departments were found. So I think it's still in one hand. Um, I'll work to remedy that. Um, thanks for having me here today, and thanks again to the sponsors. I, I hadn't realized that I was in part working for Pioneer Hybrid. Um, that's new for me, so I'll have to think about the implications that that has for some of my other research. Um, uh, I want to start off uh, with a note about the modesty of my aims here. So I'm going to walk you through um, some objections that the Ojibwe have la uh, uh, launched against certain kinds of wild rice research. Um, and while it should be clear that I'm sympathetic to these objections, and I think that they've been dismissed too cavalierly by certain actors involved in this discussion, uh, my point here today is not to convince you that these objections are uh, in the end, ultimately sound. Um, that would take a lot more time than I have, as I hope you'll appreciate. Um, rather, I just want to help you understand what the discussion is about, what the issues are, and at least see that some of the concerns do merit, I think, sustained um, discussion. Uh, another thing to note before I get started is that I am going to present a reconstruction of these objections. So my sources here are largely media reports, um, web-based uh, information available from some of the Indian groups uh, involved, um, uh, the resolutions that have been put together that uh, express opposition to this research. But there are many gaps in these sources of information, and sometimes the arguments are more alluded to than actually given. And so I'm going to take the liberty at some points to sort of fill in some of the gaps from the academic literature where some of these arguments have been explored in a fair bit of detail. Uh, but it is a reconstruction and whether or not it's, it's perfectly faithful to what um, the people who are actually objecting to this research have in mind is something that uh, I can't claim to have much confidence in. So a little bit of background about uh, the Ojibwe and wild rice. So the Ojibwe, also referred to as the Chippewa, um, back in the uh, 1940s, um, things started to change for the Ojibwe. So that before then, they had been the primary cultivators of wild rice, and it had uh, been an important staple both economically and culturally for them. But in the 1940s, the non-Ojibwe, the white European settlers, uh, started developing their own processing plants and began harvesting wild rice using combine harvesters, 
so on a much larger scale than the traditional methods used by the Ojibwe. Uh, and that sort of is, marks the beginning of the decline of Ojibwe involvement in wild rice production. Not that they're not still involved, they're heavily involved, but as sort of a percentage of the production and the number of actors, uh, we have many, many other non-Ojibwe people now involved. Um, in the late, by the late 1960s, uh, you really had large-scale commercial production of wild rice taking off. The non-Ojibwe growers had succeeded in growing wild rice in cultivated paddies as opposed to the uh, lakes where there are natural stands. And researchers at the University of Minnesota and also my home institution, the University of Wisconsin-Madison, uh, had developed uh, non-shattering wild rice strains that could withstand the impact of the harvesters, uh, better harvesting equipment, better disease control, and that really facilitated the takeoff of large-scale commercial production of wild rice. In fact, it was so successful that by 1986, uh, there was a huge glut on the market and the prices fell precipitously. Um, and that did severe damage to one of the most important stable sources of income for the remaining Ojibwe ricers. And it didn't just have a negative impact on them, it actually caused problems for the non-Ojibwe producers as well. Um, the uh, increase in quantity was not really sufficient to keep their bottom line afloat given the decrease in prices. Um, and in fact, uh, I'll talk a little bit about a patent that a California company by the name of NorCal has. And in their discussion of the importance of this patent, which is going to facilitate further yield improvements in wild rice, according to their claims, um, as justification for their development of this invention, uh, they cited the fact that the prices had dropped so much that they needed to increase yield more to help with profits. Um, there's a bit of a circle here. Uh, people who do technology studies uh, talk about something called the technological treadmill, where you introduce a technology in response to a problem, and in fact, the technology is only going to exacerbate the problem in the future. So here's a case where you had significant improvements in yield that resulted in a drop in prices, and the response from one of the companies is, well, we need to increase yield more. Well, that's exactly what got you into that problem to begin with. Uh, so uh, we can discuss during the Q&A sort of what the wisdom of this is, but um, the point here is that by 86, uh, there was a glut on the wild rice market, and the Ojibwe, who were already struggling in many ways, uh, felt like they had taken yet another hit. Um, the uh, discussion that I'm going to lead you through, uh, at least in terms of my own interaction with it, uh, started with a publication in 1999 that then got substantial discussion at several academic conferences. So in 1999, researchers at the University of Minnesota, led by Ron Phillips, um, published the first dra draft of a genomic map of wild rice, so a map of the genome um, of wild rice. And uh, they advertised this. It was a big uh, research finding, and uh, the university was very proud of this. Uh, and they argued that this was going to be very helpful for the following kinds of reasons. So these are some selected quotes from their publication. So they say that although progress in breeding and genetics with wild rice has been difficult, uh, their map will provide an important foundation for genetic and crop improvement studies. It will be especially useful for genetics research and marker-assisted breeding, and it provides tools to assist in the domestication of this important food source. Uh, this is also of interest to other people who do genetics and genomics work on cereal crops because the genome for wild rice can be used to make inferences about the cereal crops. But nonetheless, compared to other cereal crops, according to the researchers, wild rice is particularly poised to reap these kinds of benefits because it's just beginning to be domesticated. So they have a clear picture in mind of what they hope to accomplish with these kind of genomics, genomic maps, uh, that it's going to facilitate further modification that they think will constitute improvements in wild rice strains. So this came out in 1999. Uh, in 2002, there was a meeting of the National Agricultural Biotechnology Council, which is a consortium of 25 or so academic institutions who engage in biotechnology research. And the mission of the council, I've got uh, some of it quoted here on the board, mission is to provide an open forum for persons with different interests and concerns to come together to speak, to listen, and to learn from meaningful dialogue on the potential impacts of agricultural biotechnology. And another part of their mission is to facilitate active communication among various stakeholders to ensure that all viewpoints contribute to the safe and effic efficacious development of biotechnology for the benefit of society. 
Uh, the Ojibwe, uh, several groups of Ojibwe, led by the um, White Earth Land Recovery Project, which was started about 18, 20, maybe 22 years ago now, uh, by Winona LaDuke, excuse me, who is um, Ojibwe, uh, organized a protest uh, at this um, uh, annual meeting, uh, citing the recently published genomic map as sort of the focal point of their, um, of their being upset. And uh, the mission statement is particularly poignant, I think, because to the best that I could ascertain, the protesters were never actually invited in to participate in that annual meeting. Um, and so I don't think it was a shining example of an attempt to really reach out and provide an open forum or f to facilitate active communication. So the um, Ojibwe groups that protested, and I'll give some detail about the protests in just a minute, um, were clearly uh, motivated and felt a sense of urgency about the issue because the role that wild rice plays and has played for a long time in Ojibwe culture. So to quote Winona LaDuke, she describes um, part of the creation myth of the Ojibwe uh, when she says that according to that myth, Manuman is a gift given to the Anishinaabe from Gicho Manadu, the creator. So Manuman is the Ojibwe word for wild rice, and Anishinaabe is the uh, word for Ojibwe in their own language. So it was part of the creation story that this uh, people have that wild rice was there from the start. They were at one point told to go and search for the food that grew in lakes. That was part of what they viewed their uh, charge from the creator to be. Uh, and David Venom, who has, I think, the best uh, summary history uh, well, the best history of wild rice in Ojibwe culture summarizes the situation as follows. He says, quote, traditional Ojibwe life elevates rice above being good simply for consumption or barter. Stories and legends reinforced by the ceremonial use of manumen and taboos and prescriptions against eating it at certain times show the centrality of wild rice to Ojibwe culture. So they felt that this uh, research really did pose a threat to something that was very fundamental to their way of viewing the world. Uh, the White Earth Land Recovery Project managed to get resolutions passed by several groups, um, which are listed here. I think a few other groups have added on over the years and also submitted sort of formal uh, protests to the University of Minnesota to try to get some action on this, um, on this issue. Some typical language from the resolutions. So the top is from the Red Cliff Band of Lake Superior Chippewa. And uh, it's about a page long, uh, excerpted here. So they uh, do hereby oppose all patenting and genetic research being conducted on wild rice. And they call on all natural resources agencies to protect their property rights, which include wild rice, from risk by outlawing the research and the potential for a contaminated gene pool of Mother Earth's wild rice. The Bad River Band of Lake Superior a tribe of Chippewa Indians had an interesting exception that might become relevant to our discussion later, depending on how the discussion goes. Uh, they hereby formally announced their opposition to the issuance of patents or Plant Variety Protection Act certification, so another kind of intellectual property that you can get over seeds um, of wild rice, and their opposition to the continued research on wild rice with the following exception. Other than genetic research, which is conducted for and by Bad River, or entities authorized by Bad River and which is necessary to identify and protect wild strains. So an explicit acknowledgement that at least in certain cases, research could in fact help promote conservation efforts, help the Ojibwe themselves, and they, weren't, they didn't want to cast their opposition too broadly here. So there were some differences, but most of the resolutions followed the uh, language of the earlier, the top um, quote there. So what were the activities that they were objecting to on ethical grounds? Um, they were objecting to the genomic mapping of wild rice that had been completed. They were objecting to the genetic modification of wild rice strains. They were also objecting to the development of male sterility in wild rice, something that um, NorCal had done. They were objecting to the patenting of modified strains, and then they were also objecting uh, to the way the labeling regulations work. So Minnesota has some regulations of, that prevent um, what we might refer to as inauthentic wild rice from being called wild rice, uh, but they nonetheless allow import and sale of that kind of rice so labeled in Minnesota. And so the California producers, which are very large, label it the way they want to, and then they ship it into Minnesota and it gets sold in a way that makes it hard for consumers to distinguish between authentic wild rice and uh, patty grown wild rice. So that's also an issue that's discussed. I'm gonna drop that just for time uh, purposes, but it is an issue. 
Um, going back to the other ones, I'm going to go through these and look at uh, the relations between them and some of the arguments in favor of thinking that these things really are unethical. Um, but they are all based on things that had happened. So the genomic mapping had already been published. Uh, the genetic modification of wild rice strains, University of Minnesota, had already developed several new strains through hybridization uh, in terms of male sterility, so making uh, crops that uh, the male uh, crops which can't fertilize themselves, which is very useful for certain kinds of breeding techniques. Uh, NorCal had developed two strains of those through hybridization, and they had patents on those. Um, and uh, the Bayh-Dole Act, which I'm sure will come up at several points today, um, does authorize universities and provides incentives for public universities to try to acquire patent rights and to commercialize research results uh, for the products of federally funded research. So the issues here aren't sort of science fiction. I'm a philosopher. We often get into fun science fiction examples, especially with biotechnology, and we talk about aliens and all kinds of fun things. But these were pretty down to earth, and they were worried about things that had happened or that uh, there were reasonable concerns were going to be happening in the future. The reaction provoked, uh, the, the uh, protest uh, provoked several reactions that were um, relayed in the press. So Ken Forster, who's president of NorCal, the company I mentioned, said, uh, quote, I don't understand why what we're doing would interfere with the spiritual aspect of wild rice. We're not trying to stop them from doing what they do. Uh, Philip Larson, who at the time was associate dean uh, at University of Minnesota, said that the researchers are not doing anything to damage the sacredness of the crop. Uh, Chuck Muscaplatt, who was dean, um, said, quote, if a researcher has money to support his work and he isn't breaking the law, I don't think I can tell him to stop doing what he's doing. Uh, and then Ron Phillips, the lead researcher, uh, said that there are different value systems at work here, suggesting that it was sort of at, at rock bottom a religious uh, difference between the way the Ojibwe view um, these issues and the way the scientists view these issues. Uh, hopefully, at the very least, I'll convince you that, that things are not that simple. Uh, there is certainly a, stra a strand in the discussion that does focus on the claim that wild rice is sacred, and that adds a lot of urgency to the protests. Uh, but there are lots of other issues as well that I think people should be concerned about whether or not you actually believe that wild rice is sacred. So let's start with the genomic mapping. Um, why was this alleged to be unethical? Well, it was claimed to be unethical because it's going to facilitate making genetic modifications to wild rice, either through crossbreeding or hybridization, sort of traditional methods, or through genetic engineering. And the suggestion was that making those changes would be unethical. So although the genomic mapping was really the occasion for the protests, and a lot of the media portrayed the protests as being about the genomic mapping, that wasn't really the fundamental issue as I understood it from reading the surrounding text. Um, really, that objection was derivative on the objections about making genetic modification. Uh, so then the next question is, so what are those objections to genetically modifying wild rice? Okay. So we've got now a little bit of structure to the different um, uh, objections here where the genomic mapping objection is derivative on the genetic modification objection. So what were their objections then to genetically modifying wild rice? Well, they had several. Uh, they were concerned that it was going to exacerbate the economic dislocation of Ojibwe ricers. Uh, so they were worried that the modifications that were going to allow wild rice um, to be improved according to the researchers' standards of improvement were largely going to be beneficial to large uh, agricultural institutions that are happy to use the latest research and technology, are happy to use large harvesters and do paddy grown rice, and that that was going to increase the competitive inequality between the large uh, wild rice producers and the Native American wild rice producers. And the concern is clearly, I think, validated by the earlier history that I very briefly summarized for you, where you had extension uh, at several universities uh, doing research in ways that really did give a significant economic advantage to one group of producers over the Ojibwe ricers. Um, so I think, in a sense, this is a, sort of validated by the history of um, the way research had, uh, the impact that research had had in the past. Um, but that wasn't their only concern. They were also concerned that it was going to facilitate patents on wild rice. So at least once we get to genetically engineered strains of wild rice, which we don't have any yet, and the University of Minnesota has said they have no plans to do that, although I think that falls a little short of a commitment not to, uh, but they say they have no plans to do that. But once we get to genetically engineered wild rice, 
uh, perhaps at another institution, not University of Minnesota, um, then you can get patents on those. And for other kinds of modified seeds, you can get other kinds of intellectual property protections, the Plant Variety Protection Act I already mentioned. Um, it's weaker in some ways than patents and would require sort of a different discussion. But the, the objections were clearly worried about the patenting issues. Uh, they were worried that the modified rice is going to result in contamination of natural rice stands. Um, authentic wild rice stands, according to their understanding of authentic, quote, are critical to the economic, nutritional, and cultural survival of indigenous Minnesotans. Uh, you've got about $137 billion per year in the U.S. that's lost to invasive species. So if you think about the way that a new or modified species can affect uh, the economic ventures of people that are ongoing, uh, it can be significant. And the perception of authenticity is crucial to not just the marketability of wild rice, but also to the many non-economic uses of wild rice that I've already touched on, the ceremonial uses and the ways that the wild rice figures in important traditions. Uh, you may not agree with the way that a modification might affect the authenticity of something, and you might be perfectly comfortable with that, but if the people who are engaged in the traditions themselves are not comfortable, and if they don't view it as authentic anymore, then that's a big problem for them and one that we should acknowledge. Uh, and then finally, they did take the strong stand of saying that modifying wild rice simply is inherently wrong, setting aside any bad consequences that it might have, uh, one uh, Ojibwe was quoted as saying that modification amounts to, quote, scientific tampering with the soul of the Chippewa's sacred grain and is an expression of extreme hubris. If youth really believed that wild rice was a gift from God, then the idea that you're going to do research to make it a whole lot better is not going to sit well with you. So uh, in terms of the objections, then we have a little bit more structure. We've got the objection to the genomic mapping, which is based on the objection to genetic modification, and then we've got several different reasons for being concerned about genetic modification. There's some overlap, so the patenting issues come up here, and then there'll also be a standalone uh, issue in a minute. Um, but turning now to uh, the objection to the development of male sterility in wild rice. So here's a, a little quote from um, the patent itself. Uh, titled Hybrid Wild Rice Production Utilizing Cytoplasmic Genetic Male Sterility Systems. And uh, the technical details are beyond me. I'm a philosopher. I don't do plant genetics. But uh, their literature, NorCal's um, literature about this, basically says that this is a technique that can be used to facilitate the development of new hybrids. So it reduces the amount of manual labor that's needed to do certain kinds of breeding. So it speeds it up. Um, and that then was the objection to this proposal that um, these kinds of male sterile seeds are going to also further genetic modification of wild rice. And so now we come back to what are their objections to that? Well, we've already touched on those. So there are some interrelations between the different objections. And moreover, the hybridization used to create the male sterile seeds uh, is ex itself an example of genetic modification broadly construed. It's not genetic engineering. It's not using recombinant DNA techniques to move a gene from one species into another species. But it is modifying the genetics of the plants involved using more traditional methods. And um, although the University of Minnesota response to the protests, which in part said we have no plans to engage in genetic engineering of wild rice, focuses on genetic engineering, it's pretty clear from the surrounding literature from the resolutions and the media coverage that although they did single out genetic engineering as a special concern, they were worried about just old-fashioned ways of genetically modifying crops, including things like breeding and um, uh, uh, hybridization. So they were worried um, about uh, the impact that the male sterile seeds might have. Uh, in terms of facilita facilitating the development of other genetically modified hybrids, um, or sorry, other genetically modified crops, and also uh, that it itself is an example of something that they found problematic. So we've got several uh, points now that uh, raise worries about patenting. So let me now address the question, so what are their objections to the patenting of modified strains? And there were four that I could tease out of the literature. So one was an economic concern that the patenting was going to expose Ojibwe ricers to legal liability in cases of contamination. Uh, I'll go through these in more detail momentarily. Uh, there was also an ownership objection that patenting constitutes a kind of inappropriate ownership. Uh, 
Uh, there were concerns about what's referred to as biopiracy, uh, what researchers often would prefer to be called bioprospecting, um, and we'll talk about that. And then there was uh, also claims that the patenting was inconsistent with treating wild rice as part of our common heritage. So I'll go through these in a little bit more detail. So in terms of the legal liability that comes from patenting, uh, the issue here is that if you get your crop commingled with something that's covered by a patent, it can be very hard to discover that, it can be very hard to prevent that, it can be very hard to get that out of your cropping system once it's there. Um, and commingling of different strains happens quite frequently. It's very difficult to prevent entirely. Uh, organic foods, which people think of as free of genetically engineered ingredients, are commonly found to have very low levels of genetically engineered ingredients, and that sort of viewed as okay because they're kind of trace amounts, but it's hard to prevent entirely. Um, so commingling happens, and it's hard to avoid. Um, and the patenting regime is what's referred to as a strict liability regime. Even if you're not intentionally inf infringing somebody's patent by growing something that's covered by their patent, even if you've taken steps to prevent that from getting into your crops, uh, you can still be found liable. So there's no need to have a finding of negligence or intentional malfeasance uh, in order to show that somebody is infringing on your patent and you can still be liable for economic damages. So people are then uh, perceived to be at risk. What the quantity of risk is is very hard to uh, measure, but people are at least very concerned about it, um, that despite their best efforts, they're going to end up growing something that was patented by somebody else, and that's going to expose them then to claims of patent infringement, despite the fact that it was unintentional. In terms of the ownership objection, uh, the worry here uh, is that patents allow or confer or constitute a kind of ownership of wild rice. And this can come in stronger and weaker flavors. Uh, you might think that it's unethical to own wild rice because it's unethical to own any living thing. Uh, that's a pretty strong claim. Um, I have yeast living in my fridge that I think are my property. Uh, whether or not it extends to pets is, of course, an ongoing discussion in the animal rights debate. Um, uh, but most of us at least think that you can own plants, and that's not especially problematic. But not every culture shares that um, view. Uh, but the objection here can be phrased a little bit more carefully, albeit still pretty vaguely, that there's something special about wild rice and the attitudes that accompany ownership um, that make it unethical to own wild rice, or at least to own wild rice um, uh, while you hold those kinds of attitudes. And then the conclusion is going to be that patents on wild rice are unethical. So here's a quote from Leslie Ramzik talking about the, uh, what she takes to be the Ojibwe conception of ownership. Uh, she teaches uh, ethnobotany um, at the Lacoudere uh, Ojibwe uh, College. Um, and she says, quote, all plants have a life and spirit, just as all other things. I try to extend courtesy and respect to the plants most of the time. I sense their life and spirituality and know that if they did not share this with me, I would not survive. No individual, be it plant, animal, or any other being, can own something. There's only sharing. Sometimes the sharing is done willingly, sometimes not, but it's sharing. So there are room for different cultural understandings of what exactly constitutes appropriate or acceptable ownership. Um, I would be surprised if uh, Ramzik uh, believes what she's saying here to the very letter. Um, because it's very hard to get by in modern society without conceiving yourself as owning a fair bit of things. But she clearly has a different conception of ownership and she thinks that it's important that it be accompanied by a certain kind of respect for the life and spirit of the things that are um, being owned. And um, David Venom, uh, the historian that I mentioned, uh, talks about the different attitudes that accompanied uh, ownership or possession of, if we want to put it more neutrally, wild rice as between the Ojibwe and the people who were largely displacing them. So David Venom says, the Indians' whole legal system in regard to wild rice involved protecting it. So it did allow for certain kinds of ownership, but with an aim to protection. From their vantage, whites seem interested only in exploiting the product by whatever means, including enacting laws to gain the upper hand. Unable to, to appreciate the deeper meaning of manumen in Ojibwe life, they pay little attention to its ceremonial use, were oblivious to the role of wild, light, wild rice in legends. They regard the rice camps uh, as mere social diversions interfering with the harvest, so this was an important ritual surrounding the collection of rice from the lakes. 
Uh, and they generally considered the lack of concentrated effort to gather every grain possible an indication of Indian indolence or stupidity. So the rate of harvesting that the Ojibwe did using traditional methods was much lower than um, it could be with more modern and more aggressive tactics. Uh, it turns out that when you employ those tactics, what you end up doing is involve, being involved in an unsustainable approach to these, and you end up in the long run actually uh, doing damage to your crop as opposed to doing it in a more sustainable way. And uh, Venom here again comments, where whites have succeeded in gaining control of the production of staples formerly Indian, Indian and the commercial overfishing of sturgeon in the Boundary Waters area, for instance, the results have often been ecologically disastrous. So the different attitudes often actually have uh, different effects on their behavior and practices, and that has different effects on the actual uh, sustainability of the kind of harvest that's taking place. So the ownership objection was clearly discussed in the literature surrounding these protests. Um, a little bit of time on whether or not this withstands scrutiny. Uh, do patents really constitute a kind of ownership? Uh, and we may hear more about this later, um, but at least on many views, ownership is viewed as a bundle of rights, uh, typically, including both, both, typically including both negative and positive rights. So my ownership of a cup of water means that you can't come take it, right? So it's a negative right against your interference. You can't prevent me from drinking it, drinking it but it's also a positive right to my own ability to use it. So it includes both negative and positive rights. Uh, patents are entirely consisting of a bundle of negative rights. They're the right to exclude others from doing certain things. But you can have a patent on something that you have no positive rights to. You can't produce it, you can't sell it, you can't market it, maybe because it hasn't passed certain kinds of environmental regulations, for example. So if you're patenting some new kind. Excuse me. If you're patenting some new kind of genetically engineered microorganism, you have to get certain uh, regulatory uh, hurdles crossed before you can do any of that. Well, you may have the patent long before those are done. Um, so patents are entirely negative rights, and many people would infer that the conflation of patents and ownership is actually a mistake. Um, I think that's a tricky argument to make. I don't think it's a coincidence that in a conference or seminar uh, entitled Who Owns Life, that a large part of that discussion is about patenting. And patenting is a kind of intellectual property. And you can't distinguish sharply property from notions of ownership. They're very intimately related. Um, when the US Patent Office uh, announced that they would not allow patents on human beings, one of their justifications was that uh, that would constitute an infringement of the constitutional prohibition on slavery, that is, owning human beings. So even the US Patent Office has said that patenting constitutes a kind of ownership. But I don't know that we need to get too hung up on the exact details of what the best conception of ownership is. I think the better question to ask here is simply, are the concerns that motivate the ownership objection reasonable, regardless of whether patents constitute a kind of ownership? So if you're worried that ownership is going to be accompanied by inappropriate attitudes that are going to have bad ecological consequences, then just skip straight to the question, well, will patents also encourage those kinds of attitudes, or will they be accompanied by those kinds of attitudes? And then we could have a discussion about the extent to which these um, concerns uh, ultimately are justified. The next objection to the patenting of wild rice uh, I've referred to here is the biopiracy objection. So Michael Hansen uh, summarizes this as following. The most immediate impact for Native Americans is the patenting of traditional crops by biotech companies whose representatives arrive at a tribal location, access an elder, acquire whatever information they can regarding the history and characteristics of a particular crop, and then patent it as their own. That's a description of something that happens. Uh, and then there are two alleged ethical problems with that. One is that it can often result in an unfair distribution of the benefits. So you've got one group who has done a lot of work in the cultivation and care of a resource, a certain plant strain. They've identified certain medicinal properties of a, a traditional plant, those kinds of things. And now you get another group coming in, and because they come in at the last step, into, sort of into the production of that in a mass marketing uh, context, then they can get a patent and now they have a right to the proceeds without any obligation legally uh, to share any of the benefits. And that is perceived by many people as unfair. Uh, and then another concern that was talked about in the literature surrounding the protests was that patents are going to allow uh, biotech companies to control the Native Americans' use of wild rice. Uh, 
Um, because it came from their uh, fields originally, if you get a patent, then the concern was that the patent would cover the wild rice that the Native Americans were growing. Uh, I think that's a difficult argument to make. It was there in the literature, so I've included it, but uh, patents, at least if the patent system is working as it's supposed to, patents can only cover new and substantially improved innovations. Uh, they can't sort of retroactively be used to control resources that um, were already present prior to the development of the invention that's getting a patent about. Um, so I think that's going to be problematic. Uh, in the case of NorCal, which has the patents in question, it took them 15 years to develop their strains of male sterile wild rice, and their patents on those strains would no, in no way prevent people, even in the U.S., from continuing to use the wild rice from which it was derived. It only prevents people from using the male sterile strains of wild rice. Uh, and it's also worth noting that um, a U.S. patent doesn't constrain activities in other jurisdictions, and the relationship between the Ojibwe and the United States is a federal one, so they are another jurisdiction. Uh, that only mitigates it to a certain extent because obviously they do want to sell these things in American markets, and so it would still uh, cause problems there. Um, concerns about contamination remain. Um, if, even if the patent is on something new, uh, if it contaminates your food and you try to sell it in an American market, there's going to be concern. And concerns about the unfair distribution of benefits remain, but I'm not sure that this would really give a private company sort of control over the stocks in a, in a lake. That would be uh, a very big surprise. Final objection that I'll walk through uh, is what I'll call the common heritage objection to patenting. So Suzanne Nelson uh, says, quote, I don't believe that companies should be able to own genetic resources, or individuals for that matter, or tribes. These are really a common heritage for all of us. So here the problem isn't that a private company is patenting these things, and we might be worried about the attitudes that accompany that in a particular commercial context. Here the concern is that these things are something that everybody should have access to. And patenting, because they give exclusive rights to people, often, depending on the way the licensing works out, uh, but that is then a restriction on the availability of resources that really belong to the common heritage and so should be accessible to all. Now, this uh, idea of a common heritage uh, can take two very different forms, and these are distinguished in the legal literature on this kind of thing. Uh, so one I'll call the common heritage duties doctrine, and the other I'll call the common heritage property doctrine, and I'm following one of my colleagues, Pilar Osario, who has written on this. So in terms of the duties doctrine, there are lots of examples where we have historic buildings or great works of art, uh, cultural artifacts and natural wonders, and people say that these are part of our common heritage and they're actual legal protections for these kinds of um, uh, examples. And the focus behind the idea that these belong to the common heritage is that we have a duty to preserve these. Uh, all people have an important ethical duty to preserve, share, educate others about these important and uh, cultural and natural objects. Uh, when the value of those sort of represents or encapsulates the heritage of a people and its culture. So when we think of common heritage, something's belonging to the common heritage as meaning that we really should be preserving this for the, uh, for the appreciation by all, then that might well be consistent with patenting and ownership uh, depending on some of the uh, downstream consequences of those, but at least it's in principle consistent with patenting and ownership. Just as a person can own a home or work of art, while it's nonetheless protected by laws governing cultural artifacts or historical buildings, uh, you can still own it. You can still have a patent on it. It's just that the regulations regarding the fact that this is part of our cultural heritage, common heritage, uh, restricts exactly what you can do with it. So you can't, for example, throw your great painting into the fire and you can't knock down your home. But that's consistent with saying it's still mine, I still own it. Um, and this would probably uh, give others a right to access the resource. So you can't keep these things uh, in private. You have to make them accessible in certain ways. And it would impose duties to preserve, share, and educate. So in, to my ear, these things sound quite uh, reasonable. Uh, given the cultural role that wild rice plays in the Ojibwe's traditions, uh, it seems reasonable to say that we do have an obligation to try to preserve the resource and to appreciate the way that it's used. Now another understanding, though, of the common heritage uh, doctrine is uh, a little bit more aggressive. So here we have examples of things like communal farmland, uh, the moon, uh, is part of the common heritage of mankind. Uh, the deep seabed belongs to the common heritage of mankind. 
And when people talk about these belonging to the common heritage, they're not so much focusing on the preservation of these, uh, rather they're talking about getting fair benefits for the community from these things. So the focus here is on the fair exploitation of resources and the fair distribution of benefits. So whereas the preservation idea might lead people to try to leave something alone, the property doctrine says, no, of course, this is a resource that we can get economic benefit from, but there are restrictions on how that benefit should be shared among the people to whom uh, it belongs in terms of their common heritage. So uh, when we're thinking of the property doctrine, when we're thinking of things belonging to the common heritage in this way, uh, you're going to say things like, no single entity can have sovereignty over or appropriate the resource in question. So everybody can have access to the deep seabed if they want to go mine it for things. Nothing about preserving it. It's about everybody being able to exploit it on fair terms. Uh, all people should share in the management authority uh, of some sort, which is going to manage the resource for the benefit of all. So here we have a kind of different conception of something's belonging to our common heritage and a different sense of what the duties are that arise from that. It's more about exploitation uh, on fair terms, less about uh, preservation. Uh, the common heritage property doctrine, I think, probably would be inconsistent with patenting because here we are giving uh, one individual or one group an exclusive right uh, to the use of something, thus excluding others from benefiting uh, from that thing. Uh, and it would address the unfairness worries about biopiracy because you wouldn't be able to um, appropriate a resource without some kind of uh, means being in there for a fair distribution of the benefits to result from that appropriation. Uh, so I think unlike the um, duties doctrine, this one is inconsistent with patenting. Uh, and I would suggest that but this is probably inconsistent with the values of those who think that wild rice is sacred and therefore shouldn't be manipulated or commodified in, appropriate way, in an inappropriate way. People who really believe that this is sacred because it's a gift from God uh, aren't really concerned about you know, maximizing exploitation of this in a fair way. They're in fact worried about certain kinds of exploitation. Um, so I'm not sure that this is going to be very prominent among the people who think that this is going to be a very prominent conception of the common heritage doctrine among people who think that wild rice is sacred. Okay. So here's a quick summary of the overall structure of these objections. And as you can see, they're relatively detailed. So again, the focal point of a lot of the conversation was about the genomic mapping of wild rice. And the Ojibwe were accused of sort of being opposed to just the bare act of gaining knowledge about genetics. And as far as I could tell, that actually wasn't present in the literature. Their concern here was not just about doing the research and finding out knowledge. Uh, their worry was about what the consequences of that knowledge were going to be. It was going to lead to genetic modification of wild rice or the development of male sterility or patenting. And then these, in turn, were supported by a variety of diff different considerations, worries about increased economic dislocation, worries about uh, contamination of natural rice stands, which might have uh, cultural significance and also economic significance. Um, and then there was the idea that because it's sacred, um, uh, the modification was itself inherently wrong. Uh, in terms of the development of male sterility, the worries here again were derivative on others. They were worried that it was going to facilitate further genetic modification and that it itself was an example of genetic modification which might have the bad consequences just mentioned. And then in terms of patenting, they canvassed uh, a wide variety of issues that are very commonly discussed in the patenting literature and which I'm sure will come up with speakers later today. So many of these were not by any stretch unique to the wild rice situation. Uh, there are uh, discussions about um, patenting human DNA, patenting living organisms, patenting human tissues and those kinds of things where these kinds of objections are also um, talked about. So nothing unique uh, here, even if the um, particular uh, religious and cultural views of the Ojibwe sort of add urgency to some of the issues. So uh, in conclusion then, as I've tried to suggest, some of these ethical object objections are derivative on others. Um, some ethical objections seem to ba be based on values that are distinctive to the Ojibwe. So the fact that modifying it is inherently wrong because it's sacred, that does require commitment to a particular, uh, what I would call a religious view, broadly construing that term. Um, if it is sacred, then there are follow-up questions about what ethical norms govern its treatment and use. Uh, 
we might think that many things are sacred in a sense without objecting to their modification. Um, if you think that communion is sacred, for example, uh, it gets modified when you eat it and when you cook it, and, but those are okay. So we need some principle for distinguishing between acceptable or appropriate modifications from others and then an application of that principle to the wild rice case. Uh, some ethical objections seem to be based on very widely shared values. Um, what's the likelihood of contamination of the natural rice stands by modified um, rice? And if that occurs, how extensive is it going to be and what economic impact will that have? Uh, what will the economic impact of cultivated paddy rice that's now using the uh, advertised improved uh, modifications be on Native American ricers? And then uh, the idea of fair compensation to Ojibwe for their work and the traditional cultivation and preservation and stewardship of wild rice. I think these are kinds of concerns that form uh, part of what Rawls would call sort of a reasonable overlapping consensus uh, where we can all appreciate the force of these. Um, and then some ethical objections seem to be based on widely shared values about respect for values that need not be widely shared. So they're not distinctive to the Ojibwe, but the fact that the Ojibwe have certain religious uh, views does play a role in why we should care about these things. So should wild rice be viewed as part of the common heritage? And if so, according to which conception? I don't have to agree that something is sacred in order to appreciate that it is nonetheless part of the common heritage of a people and should be accorded a certain kind of protection because of that. I might not like a particular painting and might think that other things meek, it would be fine to throw it in the fire. But that doesn't bar me from appreciating that it's part of our cultural traditions and should be protected as such. So I don't have to be committed to the underlying substantive claim about the value of the thing in question in order to appreciate um, that for some people it does have that value uh, and therefore deserves protection out of respect for those people. Uh, what risk of contamination? Is it reasonable to ask of those Ojibwe who do think it's sacred? Um, trace levels okay uh, or not? Um, and then finally, uh, would the commingling of what the Ojibwe view as authentic wild rice uh, by what the Ojibwe view as inauthentic wild rice constitute an infringement of their religious liberty? If this is playing an important role in their religious ceremonies and their traditions, uh, and we take steps that uh, put the availability of those at risk, is that an infringement of their religious liberty? And what obligations does that impose upon researchers? And so with that, I'll stop, and we have a few minutes for discussion. Thank, thank you very much. I, I will ask that people uh, address your questions to the microphone, into the microphone. So if you have questions, please uh, feel free to come uh, come forward. And Rob, I, I might allow you to field your own questions sure. if yeah, you're interested. Yeah. Um, let me let me begin by kicking kicking us off with one question. I'm interested um, in the issue of freedom of conscience and under American freedom of conscience protections. There are, there's a general requirement that reasonable accommodation be made for the religious convictions of uh, the people that may make it more difficult in other circumstances for people to enter the workplace, for example. Mm -hmm. So I'm wondering to what extent protections for freedom of, a, uh, of conscience might accommodate uh, the notion that uh, reasonable accommodations might be made under these circumstances uh, or might be required in these circumstances uh, for uh, as uh, that would involve an imposition on the research on wild rice. So it's the question of whether the imposition on research that's being requested by the Ojibwe would constitute a reasonable accommodation on the part of other people. That's a great question. Um, one thing to note from the start is that it, it may or may not be an imposition on the researchers. It might be that the research could take place unfettered and we could put uh, restrictions in place on, for example, the growing and planting of modified wild rice so that it was uh, less likely to cause contamination of the natural rice stands that the Ojibwe are using. So there may be options here that are compatible with the research going on without any interference, but maybe not. Um, that would have to be discussed at length. Um, from a legal perspective, I'm going to partially punt um, because I'm not a lawyer, uh, but I would want to sharply distinguish between requests that are being made of the researchers sort of individually 
Professor Phillips, uh, I think that what you're going to do is have very negative consequences, as I've outlined. Um, would you please try to find another area of research that you could do that won't have those consequences? Um, there's nothing inappropriate whatsoever about making that request, and it may be that there's nothing inappropriate about the researcher voluntarily deciding to accede to that request out of consideration of and respect for the people making the request. I would distinguish that sharply from a request that something like the University of Minnesota have a policy that bans certain kinds of research. So there, I think, where you're talking about a third party uh, who is now uh, coercively enforcing a restriction on academics' behavior, uh, there I think you do get into interesting issues of academic freedom that are largely going to weigh in favor of allowing the researcher to do what he or she wants. Um, that doesn't mean that when the University of Minnesota appoints their next dean who sort of helps think about what direction extension should go and what kind of work they should be encouraging and promoting, that they don't try to find somebody who's congenial to these concerns and willing to lead, right? I mean, there's, no, there's a big difference between a course of policy and uh, putting key people in a position where they can lead the school in a certain way. And of course, that's what the extension uh, programs across the country have traditionally done, right? I mean, they have wanted to provide benefits for certain constituents because they think that's part of their charge. And to say, well, I think you're underestimating who your constituents are and the impact that some of your research is having on those is perfectly within, I mean, it's a perfectly legitimate discussion to have. And that doesn't violate any kind of uh, academic freedom issues. Yeah. <laughs> Mm. And therefore, you cannot have academic freedom in that way. Um, I think so. I'm a little bit worried about trying to walk through it off the top of my head, but I'll, I'll give it a shot. Um, when I mean, first of all, this isn't really human subjects research, so it's not going to be subject to that kind of review. Um, but uh, when research does violate uh, legal or ethical claims that other people have, then I think uh, there's an argument to be made that academic freedom doesn't cover that kind of research. So imagine a hypothetical uh, constructed case here. Uh, I want to do uh, research on non-consenting in non individuals that's going to involve breaking their leg. Okay? Now that individual has a claim a natural moral claim, but also a legal claim against me that I not do that to them. Is my interest in research protected by academic freedom such that the way to think about these situations is that we have a conflict of claims? I have a claim to academic freedom. He has a claim not to have his leg broken by me. And it's really a question of whose claim is stronger. I propose that's not a plausible way to think about that situation. To say I can't do that research doesn't infringe on my academic freedom in any sense. It doesn't infringe any rights of mine because I never had a right to break that person's leg. It doesn't matter if I'm an academic or not. So for, um, for an oversight committee to say, we think this violates acknowledged rights of individuals um, is going to make concerns about academic freedom less pressing. Whereas for the university as a whole to say, um, we think that uh, the general consequences here are going to be bad, therefore we're going to ban it. That's a harder argument to make. So I think there are some differences there. But again, I'm not exactly sure the force of the IRB example since this isn't human subjects research. Right. Right, but it was but still human subjects research. Right. Well, there's, a, there's, there's certainly a lot of human subjects research that does take place on tribal peoples, and it does raise very interesting and difficult issues. I'm just not sure I see that this is one of those situations. This raises the other issues that I've tried to outline, but I don't see it raising that one. It's not human subjects research. <laughs>
right? That's so, so if, it's my understanding. And if the authentic wild rice is processed in um, uh, native genes in a way that's positive for them, and paddy rice is not, then it is actually human subject to research. Potentially. Um, there are uh, many legal systems that have been implemented um, across the world, very different contexts, um, that uh, try to assure uh, proper access to and fair sharing of benefits from things that are in the common heritage. Um, I'm going to have to um, uh, refer you to Pilar Osario's work for more detail on some of those because she's the lawyer bioethicist, I'm the philosopher bioethicist. Um, but uh, I will note that the response to the patenting of something that's perceived as belonging to the common heritage is often responded to in the way you're suggesting that, look, the problem here is that patents are involved at all. We need a different kind of protection for this. But another response is that patenting might actually be part of the solution. And so there's been encouragement, for example, of um, uh, um, countries in the South that have very high uh, levels of um, uh, high, high levels of the usage of medicinal plants um, to try to patent those kinds of germplasm so that they can be sure to share in some of the benefits that do ultimately come from those, so that they would be, so to speak, on equal terms with the companies. Um, so that is one possible solution. As I was trying to suggest, it's probably not going to sit well with people who have more fundamental objections to ownership or patenting um, if they think that wild rice is sacred. Uh, but it has been used with some success in some areas. Um, but there are others as well. So we protect great works of art without thinking that they're going to be patented. So there are lots of options there. Thanks very much. Oh, we have one more. Sorry, so the question is, is it even right to say that, is it right to say that the Ojibwe own wild rice? Right. Um, that, I think we have to be a little bit careful how we put things. So owning wild rice, what exactly does that mean? Do you mean owning all wild rice? Even the wild rice that I just bought at the store and now want to cook? Um, does it mean owning the wild rice that NorCal is using their research? Uh, doing their research on that they bought through perfectly legal channels? What does it mean to say that they own wild rice? But then they sell it. So the biopiracy text that I gave, uh, I think doesn't really, I mean it fits some examples of what researchers have done. Um, but in this case, I don't know of any actual allegations that the original obtaining of the wild rice was in any way improper. It's just a question about what they're doing with it. And if that can't be criticized, then I have a hard time seeing exactly how we're going to avoid the conclusion that they own certain stands of wild rice, but other people own others. And that just seems to me to be the flat-footed, straightforward response. But. Thank you. Um, there are many questions we could continue to raise. Um, you will have opportunities to raise some of them. Rob will, Dr. Streifer will be around for some time. Uh, but 
for now, uh, join me in thanking Rob Stryker for coming back.